again. Let's take a minute. Good morning. I need my roadie to help me here this morning. So happy Father's Day to everybody out there. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that's right. So I actually want to start off, as we start off our series on Romans, talking about the foundations of faith, which Romans lays out, I actually want to talk about someone who's instrumental in laying my faith foundation. That was my own dad. I told this to the confirmation class uh, a few weeks ago. I told them about how when I hit middle school, I was in active rebellion and rejection of God, and I was on my way away. I was moving away from God, rejecting God, arguing with my dad about God, debating my dad about God. So I was going that direction. And one of the things that my dad did during that time, that season, I would say those teenage years, was he continued to share his faith with me. He continued to tell me things about how God was working in his life and the things that God was doing in his life and how he saw God's grace and love in his life and what God was doing through him and in him. He never said to me, Matt, you need to get right with God. Matt, you need to turn your life over to God. Matt, you need to turn around and start paying attention. You need a swift kick in the pants. You know, he never said any of those things. He never forced God onto me is what I'm saying. But he did continue to share his faith with me during that season. And I think that was one of the foundational pieces of my own faith today that I had a father who would share his faith with me even when I had no faith. Who didn't just take a step back and say, well, he don't want to hear anything about God, so I'm just going to shut up. (laughs) That he kept sharing his faith with me and telling me how wonderful and grace-filled God was in his life. Do you think it's a coincidence that I'm a pastor today? It's probably not, right? So what I would say to all of us fathers here today is never underestimate the power of a father's faith in a young person's life, even an adult child's life. You can still share your faith with your children today no matter how old they are. And it's not about forcing God on them, it's just simply telling them how God's working in your own life, what God's doing in your life. So dads out there, keep just telling it like it is. Sharing your faith with young people. We talk about sticky faith here, and that's sticky faith here among our young people. And that's one of the foundations, one of the people that helped lay the foundation of God's grace in my life. And one of the things we're going to learn about in Romans is this idea that God initiates this grace to us in Jesus Christ. We're going to talk a little bit about that in an overview this morning. But we have to know a little bit about what's going on in Romans. Now, if you were here a few weeks ago, I shared some numbers with you, 4, 1, 21, 1. For those of you who aren't here, I forgive us, but four Gospels in the New Testament, one book of history, 21 letters, and one book of prophecy or revelation. And Romans is the first letter that Paul, in the New Testament from Paul, those 21 letters that we talked about. So we're in Romans chapter 1 this morning, and we're looking at who Paul is. So first of all, Paul is writing to the Roman church. He is a guy who's been on three missionary journeys at this point in his life. That means he's been planting churches all over the area. In fact, he spent 25 years planting churches in different cities and towns around uh, that middle, the Middle Eastern area. And now he's planning a trip to go to Spain and plant a new church in Spain. But on his way to Spain, to start that next missionary journey and plant that new church, he's going to stop in Rome. But he's never been to Rome before. And so, just as Lou said, he's writing this letter introducing himself to them before he goes to Rome. Now, a little bit about the Roman Christians is they got there. They got a, there's a church in Rome that wasn't there before because of something that happened called Pentecost. And there were Romans there at Pentecost, and some of them converted to Christianity and took Christianity with them back to Rome and started the church in Rome, even though Paul hadn't been there, nobody else had been there, but they took their faith with them back to their city and started a church there. So Paul's writing to them. Now, a couple things, one other thing to know about the Roman Christians is that they're made up of both Jewish Christians, Jewish background, Jews who had become Christians, and what they called Gentiles. Now, Gentile is another word for it means people of other nations. So from a Jewish perspective, anybody who belonged to another nation was a Gentile. So they would refer to them as Gentiles. So you've got Jewish Christians, and then you had Gentile Christians, Roman citizens that had become Christians as a result of that. 
So fast forward several years later, in 49, the emperor, 49 AD, the emperor says, I want all the Jews out of Rome. They're causing too, much prob- too many problems with the Christians. There's all this squabbling going on. So that the emperor actually kicks all the Jewish people out of Rome, and they have to leave Rome in 49 AD. So that leaves just the Gentile Christians in the church in Rome. And so the Jews had been, Jewish Christians had been in leadership in the church. They leave. Guess who's in leadership in the Roman church? The Gentile Christians, right? And so now, fast forward a few more years, Paul's writing in 57 AD. You all taking notes on all this chronology? You got all this down? This is the last date I'm going to share, but I want to give you the historical background. So the next thing is they come back before 57 AD when Paul writes this letter. And so the Jewish Christians come back to a church that's led by Gentile Christians, and so leadership has flipped. Do you think that might cause some problems? Have you ever seen a leadership change in an organization and the stress and the change that causes it? So you can imagine the Jewish Christians coming back to the Roman church and going, wait, wait, this is our church. We started this church. We are the founders of this church. And the Gentile Christians are saying, we're in charge now. <laughs> this is our church. And so you get this conflict that's, that's brewing in the Roman church. And so Paul is going to address that in the, Roman, the letter to the Romans. Now, so he's going to talk about the foundations of faith, and then he's going to talk about how faith should make a difference in how we relate to one another, whether we're Jews or Gentiles or Greeks or barbarians or whoever we are. It shouldn't matter because our faith in Christ should change the dynamics of those relationships. So I, don't, I don't want to tell you about that. So basically what Paul is saying is that we all have... I'm blocking your view over here. So that we all have this relationship to other people. So there's me and there are others, right? You could put on here Jews, Gentiles. You could put on here white, black. You could put on here Asian, Hispanic. You could put any labels on these you wanted to, but really it's about me and other people and how we relate to one another. And sometimes, do, do you get along with everybody? Can I get a, can I get a witness here this morning? Yeah. Somebody want to come up here and tell me a story about how they're not getting along? No, I didn't think so. So, <laughs> when I was five years old, the ice cream man was coming into the neighborhood playing the tune. You know the ice cream man tune? I don't know what it is today, but he plays a little, uh, a little noise. You guys know about the ice cream man, right? The ice cream man comes into the neighborhood, and I hear the, the, the music from the ice cream man. I know he's coming. Now, the thing about the ice cream man is you've got to get out there quick, right? You, you can't hesitate on ice cream man. You know, he who hesitates is lost, ice cream. So you've got to get out there. So I run into the house because at five years old, I have no cash flow and so I run in the house. I said, Mom, Mom, the ice cream man coming, the ice cream man. I'm running through the house. Mom's nowhere to be found. So, Dad, Dad, the ice cream man's coming. Dad, Dad, I need some money. Where's the ice cream man? Dad's nowhere to be found. I'm in a hurry. I need cash. You know, call 1-800. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I remember my dad had shown me a stack of silver dollars he kept in his dresser. Why does everybody react that way? <laughs> You assume the worst in me. No, I'm kidding. So I did that. I went into my dad's, <laughs> went into my dad's dresser drawer, and I pulled out a handful of silver dollars, and I ran out to the ice cream man. So I get up there, and I order a bomb pop. You remember the bomb pop? I think they still have it. It's a red, white, and blue, you know, popsicle big thing called the bomb pop. So I order the bomb pop. I pull. I open up my hand. I pull out the silver dollar, and I pay the ice cream man. And all the other kids in line go. <gasps> He got money. Matt, can you buy me a Nutty Buddy? Sure, here, take it. <laughs> Matt, can you buy me that sherbet with the bubble gum ball on the bottom? I don't forget what that thing's called, but I remember that eating that. And then I give that, that kid a, a silver dollar. And I just start handing out all my dad's silver dollars to all the kids in the neighborhood. I'm having a great time. It's not my money. So all that happens, I'm the, I'm the hero of the day in my neighborhood because I help everybody in the ice cream man who couldn't find their parents. So I get back in the house, I meet my bomb pop. My dad was out in the garden in the back of our yard, and that's why he never heard me, I never saw him. So he comes back into the house after working in the garden, he sees me eating his bomb pop. He says, where'd you get the bomb pop? I said, ice cream man came. I said, oh, 
did your mom give you some money? No, 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 I didn't, she didn't. I'm not looking at the ceiling, I'm looking at my shoes. And he said, well, where'd you get the money? And I was like, hem, you know, hemming and hawing, and I'm like, well, it just kind of miraculously appeared in my hand. I don't know how I got there. You know, you come up with all these excuses and trying to find your way out, telling little fibs and everything, and then finally, you know, it gets fi- I get found out, you know, that I took my dad's silver dollars. Oh, man, was he mad. He was so mad. And I knew I was, had disappointed him. I didn't mean to disappoint him, but I was just thinking about me. And that's the thing about brokenness and sin in our lives, when it's usually just us thinking about ourselves, and we forget that there are other people that it may affect in our lives, or it may even affect our relationship to God. So what happened at that moment, one of the things my dad said to me was, because, you know, in the lecture, I got lots of lectures growing up. Um, he was a school teacher, so lectures were his prime disciplinary action. But he would, one of the things my dad said to me, he, says, he said, Matt, I don't know if I can trust you anymore. And what I had done was broken trust with my dad, my relationship with my dad. Our relationship was broken because trust was broken. You know, there's another story in the Bible called the Garden of Eden, And God says to Adam and Eve, um, I don't want you guys to eat. You can eat anything in the garden. You've got like 100 different options here. Just one option I want you to stay away from called the garden, this tree here that just stay away from that tree. Eat all the other trees you want. Just don't touch this tree. It's bad news. And so what did Adam and Eve do? If we know that story, what did Adam and Eve do? They ate the fruit. And so what happened to their, and so they had this relationship to God. And when they ate that fruit, what did that do to their relationship with God? What did God say to them, and why did God kick them out of the garden? It says, God said, I can't trust you anymore. You, I don't know that you're going to, I can trust, you're not trustworthy anymore. You've broken relationship with me, and so that distanced them from God. Just like we distance ourselves from each other. I want to suggest to you this morning that there's a lot, I mean, we can talk about this on an individual level, but we could put the Ferguson police and, and the African-American community on here, couldn't we? We could put um, a young man in South Carolina and the African-American church in South Carolina on here. We can put a pool party in Texas on here. We can put Baltimore on here. It's all about brokenness, isn't it? It's all about a lack of trust in relationships. It's about brokenness in relationships and how we respond to that brokenness. So the other thing, too, is that other people also have a relationship with God, right? And what Paul is going to teach us in Romans, that all have broken relationships with God. So all of us do. It's all broken. The whole system's broken. So what do you do about it? And Romans is going to teach us and tell us what God decided to do about all the brokenness in our world and in our relationships. And what, what, what we're going to discover is that God then says, you know, yeah, our relationship is broken. I'm seeing other people's relationships broken. I see their relationship broken. So I'm going to do something about it. So God takes the initiative. God says, I'm going to do something to heal the brokenness. And so that's where we are going to discover a guy named Jesus. And that God sent Jesus into the world to heal this relationship here. So that this brokenness is no longer here between us and God. Now that's significant, and I'll tell you why it's significant. Because this is God's initiative first towards us, and this is going to make a difference in how we relate to others. So Paul in Romans is going to first talk about our relationship to God and its brokenness and how God heals it in Christ. And then Paul's going to spend the rest of the letter talking about how we can heal our relationship with other people. These two things are connected. I'll give you an example. Uh, When I was in Hartford, Connecticut, I was was working for Habitat for Humanity on a a mission team. And we were in a three-story apartment building, and we were 
take, we were gutting the building, and it's great fun when you're a young person to go just tear down walls and be on the third story and throw stuff out a third story window into a dumpster. That is fun. I can't tell you how fun that is. Sledgehammer, throw stuff out window. This is stuff you, the teachers and your parents tell you never to do, right? Never throw anything out a third story window, but we got to do it. Got to watch stuff crashing down, a drywall landing into the dumpster. You get big puff. Exciting times. So I'm, we're up there. It's the first day we're out there on the project. We're up in the, uh, I'm up there in the third floor. And I, out on the street, I can hear this man yelling on the streets. Of inter, we're in the inner city of Hartford, Connecticut. This is a black Muslim male yelling at all us white people in his neighborhood. And he says, you white people need to go home. Get out of my neighborhood. This is my neighborhood. We don't need your handout. We don't need your help. And he is just yelling this over and over again and yelling at us and berating us for being in his neighborhood. He was trying to say he wanted us out of his neighborhood. He didn't want us in his community. He's like, this is my community. I'll take care of it. I don't need your help. And he's yelling out on the street and kept referring to us as you white people. And I thought about that. I felt the racial tension and the religious tension when I found out he was Muslim. And he was angry that we were there in his neighborhood. So I'm looking out the window and I'm going, oh, this isn't going to be good. But two other guys from our group go over to him and start to engage him in conversation. Not like, we, we have a right to be here. And we, we have every right to be here as you. You know, they didn't go with that. They didn't go with that. They didn't start, that's not where they even, they didn't have anything to say. They didn't do that. That's what, what they did was like, hey, man, we're just here. We're trying to help. We're, we don't mean to offend you. Let's talk about this. And so they listened to him for a while, and let's just listen to him yell and vent. And then he finally left, and we went about back to our work. The next day, he showed up at the site again, and he was just, he wasn't saying anything, but he was, Giving everybody the evil eye. You, you ever seen the evil, you know what I'm talking about, the evil eye, the stink eye, you know? Everybody's getting the stink eye. You know, if you make eye contact with him, you got the stink eye. But then I noticed that some of our young people started to do some things. They started to say, hey, you want a bottle of water? We get, we're just having a, here, you want a bottle of water? And there he was like, no, I don't want your water. And he said, when we sat down for lunch, we offered him lunch. He said, I don't want any of your food. Day three, stink eye's gone, but he's back. And he's wandering around. And then somebody says, you want a bottle of water? And he takes it. The next day, someone offers him lunch, and he takes it. And then we start to have a dialogue about what's going on in his heart and in the community. My point is this. That's a different response to a hostile situation. What gave us the ability to respond differently to the ways that we're seeing on the news, where people are not responding that way to each other? What uh, we find is that hurt people hurt people. <laughs> hurt people continue to hurt people. That's what we're seeing. But re the reason the response was different is because of this. If hurt people hurt people, then healed people heal people. Think about it. If I'm healed in my relationship to God, if I find my significance and my worth in God's grace and God's forgiveness, if this relationship is restored in me, I have less to fight for here. I don't, in fact, I don't need to fight anymore. I don't need to get my significance from other people. I've got my significance from God. I don't need that, that other person to love me and value me and agree with me because I'm already loved and valued by God. And so this relationship helps me with this relationship. And so as I seek to live in God's grace, what happens is then I begin to work to heal the brokenness in my relationship with others. Have you noticed how the, church, the people in the church of South Carolina are responding to the tragedy in their church? How are they responding? Are they responding by going, we're going to get even. We're going to get retribution. We're going to get, get, get ours. That's not what they're doing. They're saying, how can we forgive this young man? How can we be healers rather than continue the pattern of brokenness? They're trying to change the script. That's because they know God. They know grace. They know forgiveness themselves. You have to know that yourself to be able to do this. And the, and the great potential here is that if this happens, what does that do? How does that influence or impact this person's relationship to God? It can possibly lead them 
to seek God and to heal their relationship with God themselves. Who did all this? Who started this whole thing? God did. God took the initiative. God's the one that started the process of healing in Jesus Christ. So Paul wraps up this introduction to his letter with these two powerful verses. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul's saying this is for everybody, salvation for everyone. It's the power of the gospel. It is, and he says, I'm not ashamed of it. I want you to imagine for a second, if you were a doctor and you found the cure for cancer, would you be ashamed of that? If you knew you could bring healing to people, healing to people's broken bodies, would you be ashamed of that power? Or would you be sharing it like my dad shared it with me? You see, that's it. That's the power. That's why Paul's saying, I'm not ashamed of this. This is the power of God. This brings healing to brokenness. My broken relationship to God, broken relationship with other people. Why should I be ashamed? Why should I be embarrassed about that? It's a cure for the human, human's brokenness. So he says, I'm not ashamed. And then he goes on and he says this last thing. He says, for in, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. And that's our key verse for this week. The righteous will live by faith. And that's our response to God. Faith. And faith is, an, is our response back to God. So what, what, what did this brokenness represent? A, bro- a breach of what? Trust. Faith is trust. So what I'm doing when I'm having faith is I'm, I'm saying, God, I believe that our relationship to, my relationship to you is healed. I believe that your grace is real in my life. I believe that I am forgiven. In fact, I trust, not only just do I believe it, but I trust that I'm forgiven. I trust that your grace is in work in my life. I trust that you've healed me and that my relationship with you is healed. That's a faith. That's having faith in that. That gift that God sends us, our response is faith. And then that's part of what, that the righteous will live by faith. Max Licato in his book, the, In the Grip of Grace, starts off with a story about five brothers. And in that story, he said there are these five brothers. One was obedient to his father, and the four other, were, four other brothers were rebellious. And they lived near a, a torrent, torrid river, this river that was just, a cla- think of class five rapids all down the river. And that this river was also, along it were cliffs, high cliffs. And so it was just like Grand Canyon type river, if you can imagine. And it's miles and miles and miles and miles long. And their dad told them, don't go down by the river. You're going to get swept away and bad things are going to happen and you're going to be far from home, so don't go down to the river. Well, what do rebellious children do when dad tells them not to do something? Can I get a witness about that this morning? Anybody? Right. So the four younger brothers, they go down to the river, and the one brother says to his other three brothers, I just want to like, I'm not going to get in the river. I just want to touch it. I, I don't like really want, I just want to see what it's like. I just want to touch the water and just do it. So you guys hold on to my belt. You know, he had all three brothers so because he knew it was, was, was dangerous. So he says, you guys hold on to me while I dip myself in a little touch the river. Because I just want to, I want to see if dad's really right or not, right? So they got a hold of him back here and he's reaching down. And the current, he reaches in and says, oh, this isn't that bad. And as he's reaching further down, he loses his balance, and all four of them go into the river. And the class five rapids take them miles and miles down river before it spits them out up on a bank. And they're far from home now. And they're looking up the river, and they're seeing the cliffs, and they don't have any climbing equipment to get up them and over them to get back home, and so they know they're stuck. So they spend some time together trying to figure out what to do, and eventually one of the brothers comes back and says, uh, I, I've been scouting down river, and I found a village down there. I think we ought to all go move into the village. And they said, no, I don't, what if dad comes back? What if somebody comes looking for us? We need to stay here. And he says, well, I'm moving into the village. So he goes down to the village, and he builds a hut, and he starts to party with the villagers. And he's living life good. He's having a good life now. 
And so then he's living in the village. He's living on his own. He's doing all kinds of things he wants to do. He's, he's indulging himself, having a great time. And the other, one of his other brothers sees him doing this and says, you know, one day dad's going to come back. And I'm going to report back to dad about my brother. So he goes and he sits on a hill overlooking the village and he keeps record of everything his brother is doing wrong every day. He says, you just wait till dad comes back. Anybody ever do that? Every day he's sitting up there keeping track of all his sins. So you got one brother living in a village, you got another one sitting on the hill judging his brother, and then the third brother says, is feeling so horrible about himself and what he's done, feeling horrible about how he's, he's disobeyed his father, that he says, I'm going to get back to dad, and I'm going to do it, but I'm going to build a pathway back up the river, right through the middle of the river, rock by rock. And so he begins to haul rocks into the river to build a pathway miles and miles up the river, and he just goes to work, and he says, I'm going to earn my way back to, God, to dad. And he begins to build the pathway. And there sits the youngest brother by himself, wondering what to do. When one night he's sitting there at his fire in his campsite, and he hears a voice come into camp, and it's his oldest brother come to take him home. And his oldest brother comes in and says, I come to take you back to dad. I, got the way, I know the way home. I can get you home. And he says, well, is dad going to be okay when we get home? And he says, yeah, he's forgiven you guys. And uh, so he says, well, I'll go back. Well, he said, well, where are your other brothers? He said, well, one's down the village. So they went down to the village. And they go to the first brother, and he's in his hut. And they go into his hut, and they say, hey, come home. We're going back to dad. We, I know the way home is the older brother. And, they got, and he says, I don't recognize you. Who are you guys? He had become so immersed in the culture of that village that he had lost his identity as one of his dad's children. And he, then he got to the point where he said, you know, I think you guys are just here to steal my mansion, which was really just a hut compared to what he lived in with his dad. He said, I think, you, you know, he said, you're here to take my stuff away. I, I've worked hard for all this. I built all this with my own hands. I'm going to stay here, and I want to hold on. You guys need to leave. And so they left. They walked up the hill to where the brother was, you know, keeping track of all the wrongs. And he said, uh, let's go home. We can take you home. And he says, well, that's a good thing because I got this list to show dad. Can't wait to get there. And the older brother said to him, you need to just drop the list and come home. You need to deal with your own sin and brokenness first before you can start looking at other people. He said, uh, uh, what do you mean? He says, you've got to just put the list down and deal with your own sin. He says, well, I'm not doing that. Somebody's got to report back to dad. And then he became indignant and angry and he shooed them away. He says, I'm going to show you. So they finally went to the brother who was building his path in the river. And they said, come on, we can take you home. You'll never get there doing this. This is an impossible task you've put before yourself. And he kept saying, but I've got to earn God's, dad's mercy back. I've got to earn it back. I need it back. I've got to prove to dad that I am worthy of his forgiveness. And he couldn't let go of the rocks. In fact, he got so mad at them trying to get him out of the river that he picked up one of the rocks and threatened to throw it at him. He said, I'm going to prove to dad that I deserve it. And so finally the youngest brother got on the shoulders of the eldest brother and the eldest brother carried him home. And that's faith. Faith is trusting that Jesus can get you home. Indulgence won't get us there. Judging others won't get us there. Earning it, working hard for it, won't get us there. The righteous will live by faith. Amen.